I want a refund. I asked for two things, only two things. One, that they play Monster Mash, and two, that Tim Cook be dressed as Frankenstein because he basically already is Frankenstein in real life. But no luck on either. At least the world's fastest keynote, it literally was half the length of the second shortest Apple event in history, brought with it more chip skews than new computers, which I think is also the first time that's ever happened. We got the whole M3 family, baby. M3, M3 Pro, and M3 Max. Now, while all new chips are based around TSMC's three nanometer process, there's a little bit more nuance to that. You see, this is an exciting departure from the norm because while the M1 was based upon the year old A14 and TSMC's N5 process, and M2 was based upon the year old A15 Bionic and N5P process, it does not appear that the M3 is based upon the year old A16 Bionic. It's all but certain to be a direct descendant of the iPhone 15 Pro's new A17 built on TSMC's N3B process. Why is that interesting? Who cares? Well, Taiwan Semiconductor's three nanometer node will contain four, kind of five, but most likely four process technologies. N3 Baseline, or N3B, has been shipping since late last year, theoretically. More on that in a minute. And the second half of 2023, now, was supposed to bring N3E, a refined process over N3B that brings with it a number of key advantages. One, dramatically reduced complexity using six fewer EUV layers and no double patterning, which means higher yields and subsequently lower costs. Number two, while it has lower logic density, it has a three to 5% increase in performance or a five to 7% reduction in power consumption, you can choose at the same clock speeds. And perhaps most importantly, number three, N3E shares the same design rules for the upcoming optical shrink N3P, <laughs> which will offer greater density, power efficiency, and a bunch of other stuff that TSMC is pretty confident will make it the most popular three nanometer node. Long story short, Wider process windows and better yields mean more powerful, less consumptive, cheaper chips. It's a win, win, win. So here's why this all matters. Everything out there suggests that the N3B process didn't really hit the marks with lousy yields, high cost, and essentially everyone other than Apple turning it away to wait for N3E. That's also due to Apple being the highest paying and most demanding customer. It's reported that despite Apple being the sole N3B customer, even they had to reduce their order size for the A17 Pro due to TSMC's inability to hit targets. And the bottleneck doesn't just stop there. TSMC, just two weeks ago, stated volume production on N3E would begin by the end of the year, when literally every rumor suggested that Apple was done with keynotes and product launches for 2023, well, it made sense. They were waiting on TSMC and N3E. But then they announced this keynote last week. <laughs> These computers announced today are shipping next week. And unless TSMC was being bearish towards its investors, unlikely, M3 is based upon the older, more expensive, lower yield N3B process. And while that's not really a problem in and of itself, it does explain the downright goofy quantity of chips available for configuration. It's almost certainly a yields problem, and they're just sticking whatever they can, wherever they can. And there's some issues with that. So the CPU gets seemingly uneven, but modest bumps across the lineup with anywhere from about 10 to 20% improvement across performance cores. This is great. It's about the same jump in efficiency that we saw going from M1 to M2. Now the efficiency cores, surprise, surprise, are also more performant this year. However, they're also more numerous on the M3 Pro. There are six instead of four. On the surface, well, this sounds great. How can we go wrong with more cores? But there is some weird chopping going on here as the M3 Pro has a reduction in P cores, a reduction in GPU cores, and a slower 192-bit memory bus. Uh. Now, one could argue that this is due to the memory moving from 16 gigabytes at the base capacity to 18 gigabytes, but I don't really buy this because this choppage doesn't stop with the Pro. While the M3 Max is insulated from chopping on the top end SKU, there is a cut down model that features a 30 core GPU and a 14 core CPU that frustratingly seems to cut a quarter of its memory bus to 384 bits down to three channels from four. That's why memory configuration is SKU dependent. This is a fairly substantial downgrade from the M2 Max. And, and why? Well, <laughs> to save money, because I mean, you're only spending $4,300 on this machine. 
Now, while I'm complaining, the configurator this year seems extra slimy. When you upgrade the SoC, it lists an upgrade price, but doesn't really reflect the true price increase because it also bumps up the memory spec to its minimum supported specification without really notifying you about the price increase. Now, this may be an accident, it may be slimy, or it may be due to the fact that while the M3 Pro models are about the same price as M2 Pro models, all M3 Max models are significantly more expensive than their predecessors. Probably, to price out the demand curve due to low yields. Because again, N3P. Not all changes are bad, however. The new neural engine gets a small jump over M2, and the media engine this year adds AV1 hardware encoding and decoding, like we saw in the A17 Pro, which is nice to see. GPU gains by the numbers are smaller than expected, with M3 Pro only getting a 10% jump over M2 Pro, and the top skew M3 Max getting a 20% jump over M2 Max. With that said, these generic, vague numbers may for once do Apple's new chips a disservice, because the headlining announcement beyond ray tracing, which was introduced with the A17 Pro, is what Apple calls dynamic caching. Basically, the unified memory allocates itself to hardware in real time, depending on what a specific application calls for. This is known as JIT or just-in-time allocation, and it's been a thing before, but due to Apple's fairly unique unified memory architecture, not recently in consumer computing. So it will be interesting to see if this new change makes a real world difference, and perhaps why it wasn't done previously. This will be especially interesting with 128 gigs of memory, which is now available on the MacBook Pro for the first time with the full hog M3 Max chip. Get subscribed for our review on this. I purchased a loaded M3 Max and very much need the views to pay it off. <laughs> now, moving away from the silicon itself, the MacBook Pros themselves are mostly unchanged, save for the fact that the 14-inch model is now offered with a base M3. Gone is that awkward old form factor 13-inch MacBook Pro, and thank goodness. A lot of people seem to think this is a weird move, but I don't at all. Over WWDC, in an interview with John Gruber, Apple executives stated that the 13-inch MacBook Pro remained a very strong seller in the lineup. And I think that's because the average consumer is stupid. <laughs> they know the MacBook Pro is supposed to be better. So when they go into a store and see an Air and then see a Pro, they go, well, the price is almost the same. Why would I not go with the Pro? It was a way to cash grab the uninformed. This new model brings real world benefits over a MacBook Air. You get a significantly better display, better battery life, improved speakers, a better webcam, and more. In exchange for, I guess, an extra half a pound in your backpack and a few hundred extra dollars over what I presume will be the soon to ship M3 MacBook Air. That is, if Apple doesn't just skip it altogether and go straight to M4 on an N3E process. Huh. Letters and numbers, how do they work? Needless to say, I think this computer is going to be a good buy. The $1,599 price tag is a little bit on the high side because that's about the same price that you've always been able to get a base model M1 and M2 Pro MacBook Pro on sale, the $2,000 machine, which I've long held is the best value computer in Apple's lineup, probably in history. You can get those for $1,500, $1,600, and holy crap, they are fantastic. I hope that this new model doesn't muck that up. I would love to see it slip down to $1,200 on sale in a few months' time and then have that $2,000 MacBook Pro, as it always has, kind of slide down the pricing chart to fill in the $1,600 space. The M3 MacBook Pros themselves are rated for the same battery life, they have the same camera, keyboard, speaker system, form factor, and 120 hertz display that the M2 variants have. Well, kind of the same display. The screen can now push 600 nits for SDR content rather than the 500 nits from outgoing models. However, I suspect this isn't a panel distinction at all, and rather done in software, because third-party apps have long increased the luminance of SDR content on older models without losing accuracy in the, in the P3 color space. So I think that's probably what Apple is doing here. And hopefully, it makes its way to other M2 and M1 models, and they just do it in software and don't tell anybody because they want this to be the new selling point of the new thing. Anyway, that same display output limitation from the M1 and M2 remains. Mm. Uh, what? Oh, it comes in a new color, space black, but not on the standard M3 MacBook Pro, because that's not pro enough. You need the M3 Pro or the M3 Max MacBook Pro to get space black. 
It's convoluted. This clearly blackish computer is not full black because the keyboard deck is a much darker uh, hue. Um, apparently there's a new anodization process that they've used to greatly reduce fingerprints, they say. And I sure hope that's the case because as somebody who owns a midnight color MacBook Air that looks disgusting 100% of the time, if this thing looks the same, it's gonna be a no buy. But I think it's a go buy. Apple really harped on the fact that these are the best laptops in the world. And honestly, I have to agree, though some of the M3 updates are disappointing, the value you get in the whole package remains quite excellent. And this level of performance in an efficient and slim chassis remains remarkable. The MacBook Pro has always been the shining star of Apple Silicon, and that doesn't appear to change. What hasn't been the shining star of Apple Silicon is the M1 iMac. And while we finally got an update to the machine that skipped a generation, I mean, did we really? I mean, sure, there's new silicon, M3 over M1, but we still have two old, slow 10 gigabit USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports, single gig ethernet that's still not standard, the base SSD is 256 gigs in 20 freaking 23, and all of the included peripherals remain powered by lightning. No USB-C here. Oh, and uh, yeah, the mouse still charges like this. Now this is not a bad machine at all. It's still the poster child for hipster retail point of sale systems and the hallmark of the family computer. But it clearly remains an afterthought in Apple's product portfolio and is one of the least compelling value propositions in the entire lineup. Oh yeah, purple, yellow, and orange remain $200 more expensive because frick you. And that's all you need to know about Apple's not so spooky Hallow Eve event. What did you think? Are you picking up one of these new machines? Let me know in the comments down below. Please give this video a thumbs up, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.